Welcome back to EX280, everybody. Well, let's get started. Let's do some programming. All right, a uh, couple announcements. One is P4 is out. Yay. Uh, it will not be as hard or as time consuming as P3. So you should just like get started on it tonight, get it done, turn it in, and then you don't have to worry about it until the deadline. Yeah, oh, oh, I don't think I gave you this advice before P3. Um, it's fine to pull an all-nighter. Just like do it on the day the project is signed. <laughs> uh, okay, midterm exam grades will be out really soon. Um, we're almost done. It just took us a hot minute to grade 950 exams. But we're almost there. Um, and we will also publish the statistics at the same time. Um, we are planning to send out email, like progress reports, sort of. It'll like have our record of your grade, so you can double check that we're accurate. And then we'll also have an estimated letter grade, because I know that the curve can be kind of confusing sometimes. So we're just going to do the curve now as an estimate, so that you can have some more information. Yeah. Where do we pick up the exams? Where do we, pick up the exams? Uh, we hate picking things up, and you do too. So uh, we'll, we'll, you'll get an email with an electronic uh, copy. We scan them all in, and that's how we grade them. That's also how you can request a regrade if you need one. More questions? All right, then let's talk about dynamic memory some more. Uh, just fair warning, I, kn I know that uh, a fair number of people missed the most recent lecture with the, the most recent lecture with new material. There were a few of you who might have been panicking about Project 3 deadline. Uh, if you missed and didn't catch yourself up with the lecture video, today is going to be kind of a wild ride. But I did include review at the beginning, so here is the last couple of lectures in five slides. So, uh, we built a new version of our set data structure. We worked on the unordered version of the set because we're not going to get it. We're not going to bother with the order, the code to make it ordered. We're not going to worry about the template code right now. We're going to focus in on the dynamic memory part. So, before we had an array that was a member variable, now we have a pointer that is a member variable. So this turned into this. Um, when you have a pointer to an array, you need to know the capacity of the array. So now we have the size and the capacity. The capacity is this. And then the size is this. Size is how many boxes should I pay attention to at the beginning of the array. And the capacity is what is the total number of boxes that I could have in this set. Um, here's a big difference. Uh, we call new. And new gives us this. So now we have an array that lives on the heap. And we have a pointer. Remember, this pointer is the new part. This pointer points to the array that lives on the heap. So in this program, we have a local variable called s. That local variable, when we create it, a constructor runs. That's here. The constructor has a body that's in between this and this. And the body calls new on this line of code. New says, hey, operating system, can I have a new dynamic variable on the heap? And it says, OK, here you go. And that's how we get this. All right. Uh, I'm happy to explain this three more times if I need to, because uh, this is what's going to cause us lots of problems that we're going to fix using the code in today's lecture. Yeah? Um, so the new implementation, pretty much what you're doing is breaking up the array into its like, component variables. So uh, does the new break up an array into the two parts of information we care about? A pointer to the first element and also the, the capacity, like how many boxes there are. Yes? 
And we had to do that separately on our own as the programmer, because we know that arrays don't know how big they are, so we know that it's our responsibility to keep track separately. More questions? Yeah. Uh, so the capacity that you give them could be possibly bigger than the default? So the capacity, could it be bigger than the default? Yes, that was a big difference. Um, we can pick anything we want. Like we can make this 3,000 if we want to. It was just harder to draw the diagram with 3,000 boxes. You imagine, you know, it just gets a little bit long. And then how do you delete it? How do you delete it? So I thought you would never ask. We had a problem in the most recent lecture where we had orphan memory on the heap. So in this code, we call a function. The function is here. The function creates a local variable. Do you agree that this is a local variable? Do you agree that local variables go away when they go out of scope? So on this line of code, it goes away. When a local variable goes away, it gets popped off the stack. OK, great. This is what we already know. When do heap allocated variables, dynamic variables, when do dynamic variables go away? When you delete it. Did I delete it with the code I have on this slide? No. OK, we fixed that problem with a destructor. A destructor looks a lot like a constructor, has the tilde symbol at the beginning. And it runs automatically. It's sort of the opposite of a constructor. Constructors run automatically when the variable is created. Destructors run automatically when the variable goes away. So in this example, we had a local variable, and the local variable went away. The destructor runs. Hey, I can do whatever I want inside of my destructor. I'll call delete. Do you agree that calling delete will fix the problem we had on the previous slide? So now we run this line of code. What runs automatically on this line of code? Constructor runs, and the constructor allocates an array on the heap. Then on this line of code, what variable goes away? S. S. What runs automatically when S goes away? Destructor. And what does the destructor do? Look at this, look at this code. Calls delete, which causes this to go off the heap. What's the difference between using a uh, destructor versus delete alone? What's the difference between using a destructor versus delete alone? So look at it from this perspective. We're the other programmer that's using the unordered set class. Well, do I have any pointers here that I'm allowed to touch? I don't. I agree. Because the pointers were private. So we need somehow to get a member function to do the dirty work for us. And it's even better if that member function runs automatically so that you don't forget. So there's the reasoning for destructor. All right. We're about to make it more complicated right after I answer your question. Um, let's say you like, had a function that created an unordered set, but you didn't want that set to be deleted. What if you had a function that created an unordered set, but you didn't want it, that set to be deleted? What technique do we already know to let us create stuff and avoid it automatically going away? Just in general, what technique do we know about? Dynamic variables. If I wanted to, could I make an unordered set that was the whole thing in a dynamic variable? Yes. So, so there you go. So we could have like a couple layers of dynamic variables if we wanted to. So do you see how C++ gets complicated when you take simple, short rules, and then you, they like combine and they interact? That's when it gets complicated, when you've got these small rules that interact with each other. That's exactly what's about to happen. Please draw the stack and the heap. This slide starts out just like the previous couple slides. So that, that'll give you a hint on how to get started.
All right, and we're back. How many computer scientists does it take to project slides? Well, there's at least 100 of us in here, so. <laughs> All right, let's do some drawing. I think I need a bigger picture to draw. Uh, I, I hooked up with a wire here because my wireless thing stopped working. So uh, I'm a little disappointed that I can't walk around. But it, so I'm going to hide back here and just draw. OK, so here we are on this line of code. Uh, we're creating a new local variable. Name is s, and it's got a pointer for else. It's got size, and it's got capacity. Are you with me that the capacity is 3, the size is 0 at first? And that we're going to, um, what, what runs automatically on this line of code? Constructor, which gives me a new array on the heap. So there it is, like that. All right. Then we insert 5. Is there enough space? Yes. There it goes. Size is now 1. Everybody good? OK. Now we go this line of code. x is passed by value, which means I'm going to make a copy. So I make a copy. It's called x. It's got else, size, capacity, and I copy the pointer, and it points here. Everybody with me? You all good? Do you agree that I followed the rules of C++? I did. So now what happens on this line of code? What, what, run, what runs automatically? Destructure on S or X? On X. So X, X does something. Uh, we do something automatically. What do we do? We call delete on else. Everybody with me? Now's the time to ask because things are about to get weird. The question was, does the destructor for x run? Yes. The destructor for x as in x-ray runs. The destructor for s as in SAM does not run at the line of code that we're talking about right now. So let, let's execute. So this, the destructor runs, which deletes this off the heap. Do you agree that I called delete? And so this is gone? All right, then x gets popped off the stack, just like we already know about local variables when they go away. OK, and now I go to this line of code. What happens? The magic smoke comes out. The very special time in a microprocessor's life when the magic smoke comes out. It can only happen once, because <laughs> then it stops working. Uh, no, uh, it, it does not explode. Uh, the answer is undefined. Anything can happen, including getting the right answer, which is terrifying. Oh yeah, I wrote a very fancy animation of this. I forgot. So, so if, for those of you studying at home, this is what happens. So let me go back to the part of the code that matters for your question. So right, right here is where the destructor runs. So repeat your question. So it deletes whatever is in the heap as well as what's in the stack? So, that's so the question was, does the destructor delete what's on the stack and the heap? The, let me be really specific. The destructor is a function. The destructor, in the way I coded this, calls delete. Delete causes this to be removed from the heap. All right, then the destructor is all done. Now, the rules we already know about for local variables take over, popped off the stack. So do you see how we have two pieces of information that first the destructor with delete, second the rules we already know about local variables and a stack. This is again those interactions of small rules to make something more complicated. One more. Why do both the else pointers point to the same thing? So this is the trickiest part about the question. Because on this line of code right here, 
we're passing by value, which means we're making a copy. It, we, it, it's, it's easier to understand what happens when you copy an integer. A copy of 3 gives us another 3. A copy of 1 gives us another 1. When we copy an address, we get the same address a second time. And when you have two pointers that store the same address, that means they point to the same place. And that's why I have these two arrows that both point to the same place, like that. So the fundamental problem here was we copied a pointer. And when we copied a pointer, we got two pointers that point to the same place. So pass by value, does it copy everything on the stack? Yeah. Does it copy every? Let me be more specific. It copies all the local variables. It, it copies all the member variables. Does it copy, in, including pointers, does it copy the thing the pointer points to? No. That's, that's what we learned from this example. Well, so the, the, let me explain it a second time using a comic. So both X and S think they're in charge of the dynamic array, and they can't agree on which one's which. So we need to add some code to fix this. It gets worse. Um, well, first, let me give you some uh, terminology. Some people call this problem a dangling pointer. It's a pointer that points to stuff that is gone. <laughs> let me be more specific. It's a pointer to undefined memory pointer to something that is undefined, dangling pointer. Uh, so one way to cause this problem is when you make a copy using pass by value. How else do we make copies in C++? With the equal sign. So here's another way to make a copy of an unordered set, which copies the pointer, which means you have two pointers that point to the same place. So both of these pieces of code cause the exact same problem. We're going to solve both of these today. On the right? Are you talking about the left or the right? Uh, right. On the right. So are you, so tell me the question again. So does the constructor run because you initialize it desirable? Uh, you know what actually would be a more accurate this avoids any differences in compilers. Like that. Make sense? This is what I really mean. Equal sign copies the member variables. When you copy a pointer, you can end up with the same problem that we saw with pass by value. The key idea was we copied a pointer. Oh, does, this one makes a new dynamic variable. Uh, yes, this would make a new dynamic variable. And then it gets even worse. On that one, we lose it. So this has two problems. We destroy one that we didn't want to destroy, and we, lo we lost the one that we did. So let's, uh, I, I, I'm not trying to get into all the possible problems here. Um, again, I want to highlight that when you have when these two objects disagree about who's in charge of that heap object, that's when we have problems. So let, let's fix this. We're going to fix both of these problems today. Let's start with the, let's start with the with this problem. We'll, call, we'll solve this problem first. This is called the copy constructor. 
Do you agree that we copied a class and that's what caused the problems? So we're going to customize the way we copy a class. In the past, you've customized the way the equal equal sign works, yes? In the past, you've customized the way the output operator works. Today, we're going to, cop we're going to customize the way pass by value works. We're going to customize the way pass by value works. So again, in the past, when the compiler sees equal equal, all it's really doing is running a function that's in your class. You saw that in project three. Similarly, when the compiler sees you doing pass by value, it's really calling a function to get the job done. We can override that function and make it do whatever we want. So that's what we're going to do. Here's the type signature for a copy constructor. The job of this function is to create an unordered set that's a copy of other, the other unordered set. Exactly, this type signature is exactly what a copy constructor looks like. So write this on your cheat sheet for the final exam. The only thing that changes is the name of the class. Oh, sorry. You could call this variable uh, whatever you want. Uh, I just use other because it kind of makes intuitive sense in English. So the question was about foo and pass by reference versus pass by value. Right now, I'm talking about a very specific problem that happens when you copy a class. When you pass by reference, do you make a copy? No. So would this problem happen? No. That's why we're focusing on the pass by value, because it causes this problem. If you never pass by value, and you never use the equal sign, that's an alternative to today's lecture. You'd be surprised how useful that suggestion is, actually. Does it work? Yeah, you, as long as you don't use the equal sign. And as long as you don't pass by value. Nope, no, you can't do it, sorry. The compiler will get very, very angry. OK, so the new constructor, we start with formless blob of memory. And before, it, when we wrote a default constructor, we initialize the member variables. We're still going to do that. But then we're going to copy everything from the other set. So we do what the default constructor did in the past, plus some more work. You ready to do some more work? Let's do it. So here is the implementation of my unordered set copy constructor. How can you tell that this is a copy? How can you tell that this is some kind of constructor? No output. And this is the name of the class. So first, we initialize the member variables. I just felt like using the equal sign here instead of using an initializer list. Uh, there's no particular reason why. Actually, there was a particular reason. I didn't want you to get, I wanted as few new concepts in this lecture as possible. So else, notice how I'm calling new here. So I get another, I get a second array on the heap. This is the big difference. And then I copy from the other to the new one. Let me show you something uh, kind of squishy and uncomfortable. Remember how we had really strict rules about private and what private prevents? Unordered set has access to the private member variables of another unordered set. This is how C++ works. So at first you might say, but you're not allowed to do that. And then C++ says, oh, Bjarne told us that we could. Bjarne, the creator of C++. So this copy constructor, we'll, we'll, we'll draw some pictures um, in a minute. But I want to contrast what this thing does compared to what the other thing did. This copy constructor is different than the default method of copying. The default copies the member variables, including pointers. The copy constructor that we just made 
copies the things the pointers point to. Um, this is another thing to put on your cheat sheet right here. This and this. D copies copy the things the pointers point to. Um, that's different than the default behavior, which we saw in the intro to this lecture, the first few slides. That was called a shallow copy. In a shallow copy, you copy the address. In a deep copy, you copy the thing the pointer points to. I think today's lecture is going to get a little bit long. So let me give you 60 seconds to think about how this picture is going to be different than the last picture. And then I'll take over and I'll draw the whole picture out. So 60 seconds to think about how is this picture going to be different than the last picture we saw. Get ready for the wild ride of the copy constructor. So we're going to go line by line again. S, we get uh, else, size, and capacity. Uh, constructor runs, and the constructor causes else to point to an array that's on the heap. Size is 0, capacity is 3. Cool. Then we do this line of code, and we get a 5, and then this turns into a 1. Good? This is the same as the, since the beginning of lecture. So now we run this line of code where we pass by value. Does it look like a function runs right here? No. Does a function actually run here? Yes. What's the name of that? What's the English name of that function? Copy constructor. And the copy constructor, unlike the default, which does a shallow copy, does a deep copy. Not all copy constructors are alike, but they're pretty similar. So we've got to read the source code to see what happens. So here I am reading the source code of the copy constructor. Let's do this line of code. So first we get x on the stack with else, size, and capacity. Then we get an array on the heap. That array came from this line of code. Everybody with me there? OK. Now we're going to do uh, these two lines of code where we copy size and capacity. So we copy size and capacity. And else points to the new array. Do you see already how this is a lot different than last time? We have two pointers that point to two arrays. In the past, we had two pointers that pointed to one array. That's different. So now we're going to execute this. For loop. We're going to visit each element of the array up to the size and copy. How many items, how, how many times will the for loop run? Once to copy the five, like this. And now we, we reach this line of code. What happens on this line of code? Destructor runs. So we follow the pointer and we remove the thing it points to from the heap. Then x is gone from the heap. And now we get the correct answer. 
See how different that was? We avoided that whole mess of two pointers that point to the same heap allocated object. Um, uh, well, I never got all the way through those previous programs because they created so many problems. Let's just finish this one. What, what happens on this line of code? Destructor, Destructor runs. So this gets uh, removed from the heap. And then this gets popped off the stack. And main exits. And memory is all clean with zero leaks. The question was, when you created object x, how did you know to use the copy constructor instead of some other way to create a new unordered set? This is one of those things you have to memorize in C++. When pass by value happens with a class, the copy constructor performs the copy. When pass by value happens in C++, the copy constructor does the copy. OK, well, what if you don't include a copy constructor? No, oh, the compiler gives you one. It does a shallow copy. If you want to do something more complicated, like a deep copy, then you write your own copy constructor. This, by the way, trans this knowledge transfers across programming languages. If you ever get deeper into the Python programming language, you'll see in the documentation that the, the, everything has a, has a member function called deep copy. And there's all these programmers out there that are like, I don't know what that means. Because they didn't take each 280. <laughs> and it does exactly what we learned in each 280. Yeah? Is there much functionality to this if your uh, class doesn't have dynamic memory? Or like if your class doesn't have dynamic memory, then do we need to write a deep copy? Nope, then we don't have anything to worry about. We have a very specific problem. It's a pointer to dynamic memory. When you write a copy constructor, are you overloading? So how we overload operators for cars in project three? Yes, we are overloading. So now the copy constructor does something slightly different only when it's an unordered set. Only when the type is in an unordered set should you do what we told it to do. So we haven't messed up the ints. We haven't messed up the doubles. We haven't messed up other, other kinds of types. I'll take two more questions, and then I'm going to keep going. The, the question was about the equal sign operator, and I'm going to hold you off on that and, until we get to that part of the lecture. I'm going to wait on that. Can you say the question again? Um, suppose that we have a class with a pointer to a thing, and we want our copy that we're passing to be able to mess with stuff that's pointed to. Oh, so the question was like, what, what if you, on purpose, don't want a deep copy? Not right. Then I totally don't understand. So let's talk after class. We are going to create even more problems. So before we create more problems, let's take a five-minute break. Wait, no, no, no. I have, a, I have a chicken story first. And then we'll take a break. OK, it was daylight savings this weekend, right? So we set our clocks ahead by an hour. My chickens, I'm tricking them into laying eggs. When the days get short, they're like, oh, I need to not lay eggs because it's cold. No, no, they have plenty of food and water. They can still lay eggs. So I have a, a light on a timer in there that wakes them up at 4 AM and says, all right, ladies, it's eggs or meat. <laughs> so the light comes on, it wakes them up, and they're just like cluck, 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 and then they lay eggs in the winter. It's great. So I have a small mechanical timer that somebody might use to like turn their lamp on and off when they're not home. Daylight savings happen. And we adjusted all our clocks forward. How did I adjust my chicken timer? Now we'll take a five minute break.
So like the light, the light will come on at that time and then shut off. Okay, let's get started again. Keeping track of times and dates is one of the hard problems in computer science. There are so many programs that make mistakes in dealing with things like leap years and daylight savings and leap seconds. So before I tell you the answer to my logic puzzle, it has computer science relevance. And the relevance is if you ever deal with date and time in a computer program, use a library that's designed for it. Do not try to do it yourself or you end up making mistakes like with a chicken timer. So there are two correct answers to this problem, <coughs> neither of which involve eating the chickens. Did anyone come up with a correct answer? Yeah. Well, if you want the same amount of time as they have during the day, you just don't have to change the time. So the solution is do nothing. I agree. Because just because we changed our clocks doesn't mean that the sun decided, like, oh, I'm going to get up early tomorrow. <laughs> so now my chicken timer says the wrong time, but it turns on exactly when I want it to, which is a couple hours before dawn. Oh, what's the second one? You could adjust the timer so that the time on the timer is correct, and then adjust when it turns on and when it turns off by an hour. So you'd have to adjust three settings, the actual time, the on time, and the off time. The alternative is to do nothing. OK. Are you ready to program again? Are your brains exhausted from the copy constructor? So stay strong. We are gonna co we're going to reuse most of the code we wrote earlier in lecture in a second situation where something very similar happens. So let's talk about the equal sign. I create an unordered set. I create an unordered set, and then I, are you with me that this is a copy? What is the word for this in C++? Some, it has something semantics. Value semantics. Hey, pass by value, value semantics. Similar words, similar situation. So here is what happens without any additional code. So step one, we get, on this line of code, we get a local variable. And it points to an object on the heap. This is similar to previous code. Then we're going to make a second local variable, S2, like this. Notice that uh, I, I just decided I felt like making another array size just to prove to you that I could. And then this goes on the, on the heap. So now we have two local variables. Here's where it gets fun. This line of code. So here's what changed. Uh, we copied the local variables. So we copied the 0 over here. That wasn't a big deal. We copied the 3 over here. That changed. So I'll point that out. We made a copy. And then we copied this. I shouldn't use the word this, because we're going to use this later. We copied the pointer called else. And the pointer called else now points to the same place that uh, the S1 pointer called else points to. What's the, what's the first problem that you can observe on this picture? Leaking, 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 leaking. Another problem. We have one array and two sets point to that same array. We're back at, we now have a, pro, a similar problem to the problem we had at the beginning of lecture. Is this assuming we don't have the copy constructor? Is this assuming that we don't have the copy constructor? This code doesn't care about a copy constructor. The reason is because nothing I'm doing here gives the compiler a clue that I should be using the copy constructor. So when does the copy constructor run? When I do pass by value. Can we overload the equal sign to do a deep copy instead of a shallow copy? I reworded your question a little bit. Yes, that's exactly what we're about to do. So in the first half of lecture, we hacked the, uh, the copy constructor to do what we want. Now we're going to hack the equal sign to do what we want. 
So what we want is a deep copy from the left-hand side to, wait. We want to copy from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. From the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So we're going to redefine the assignment operator that only affects unordered sets. We're not, ints are going to work fine, doubles work fine, other data types work fine. This will only affect unordered sets. Here's something else for your cheat sheet. This is what, uh, I can't use that word. Um, my code on this slide is exactly how you overload the equal sign. If you want to overload the equal sign, copy paste my code and then change the type. Similar to before, um, you could call this whatever you want. Right hand side, if you call it RHS, it gives you like a little brain clue of what code is calling this function and which one is which. So your question was, um, I'm going to go back to the, the diagram here. So um, one problem is that we leaked memory. A second problem is that we have two pointers that point to one array. And why is that really a problem? Because on this line of code, does the S1 destructor run? I, I'm kind of summarizing your question in a longer form. Yes. Does the S2 destructor run? Yes. Do those try to delete the same thing? Yes. Are you supposed to delete the same thing twice? No. So what would, I'd have a double delete here, which is yet another problem. Uh, the error you get is, is kind of hard to remember. Yeah. In the destructor, could you set it to null pointer? Well, that wouldn't fix my problem because I have two pointers. So I'd still get in trouble. All of your, all of your questions in, uh, should help you realize that there are so many tricky corner cases that can happen when you have two pointers that point to the same thing. It's very difficult to unravel what is going on. Debuggers and pictures are really helpful here. When your code is doing unexpected things, you got to use the debugger and you got to figure out, do these pointers match what I think the picture is supposed to look like? One more. So the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, in a couple slides, it's going to matter which one is which. Because we want to read the, vari the member variables of S1, and we want to overwrite the member variables of S2. Did I, did I switch something? Oh, man. I did. OK. That's why I got confused when I was writing this. I was like, wait a second. Can I just not read English? Sometimes it happens to me when I'm in front of people. You're just like, uh, can't read English. <laughs> OK, S1 is the RHS, and S2 is the LHS. Yeah. The, this is not meant to be confusing. Left and right are still left and right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for correcting me. Let me write that down. Uh, it is true when we get in here. So uh, let's do this again. Ah, it is correct here. The input to the function is the right-hand side of the equal sign. The input to the function 
is the right-hand side of the equal sign. That's why I call it RHS. So this slide is correct. So now, where's the left-hand side? This. Uh, before I get into this, I have to make one more point. Notice that this returns a reference and not a value. There's two reasons for that. One, we don't want to make a copy. So why return anything at all? So that when you chain together equal signs, it works. So that you can chain together equal signs. In other words, if you use the equal sign on a line of code that does two things instead of just one, then the reference is useful. So the overloaded equal sign is going to do some of the stuff that the destructor did and some of the stuff that the copy constructor did. So the destructor deleted the dynamic array. We need to do that. Um, the copy constructor copied the variables and the dynamic array. We need to do that. So it's some combination of these two. Today, I'm going to copy paste code. Uh, in the future, we'll write member functions to help us sh write the code once and then share it. I'm copy pasting code today to be absolutely as simple as possible and write as, uh, have as little, oh, you gotta think about this and this and this and this all at the same time. So right now we're gonna copy paste this code. So here is our overloaded assignment operator. First we delete the dynamic array, then we copy the variables, including we're making a new array on the heap, and finally we copy the array. This stuff here is very similar to what the copy constructor did. All right, at the end we need to return a reference. How do you get a reference to this set? This. Oh yeah, and you got to dereference it. So let's dig into this. I'm going to remind you the definition of this. So remember when we did C style programming and every function had a, an input that was a pointer? C++, every member function, has an input that's a pointer. The compiler puts it there for you and then calls it this. So you can imagine all of your functions have an extra input, and the compiler is putting an extra input there for you. What if you make one of your own variable names called this? Then the scope rules. To answer your question, you need to look at, think about scope rules. Generally speaking, I do not recommend you ever have a variable called this. So how it looks, you can use the member variables without using this. You can use the member variables with using this. Those are both options. Um, notice here when you call a member function, we use the dot syntax. In C style code, it's, it's just like calling it with a pointer. So uh, the C++ approach here is syntactic sugar for the C approach. Syntactic sugar means a prettier way to write it, but under the hood, functionally the same. A prettier way to write it, but under the hood, functionally the same thing. So uh, the most important way to think about this is with the pictures. This is actually an input to a function. That's how it behaves. It behaves like it's a function input. So when a function executes, like say the print function, the print function looks like it has no inputs. It actually has one input. It's a pointer, and the name of the pointer is this. This pointer points back around to the set that came before the dot. 
So it's syntactic sugar for the C style abstract data types. C++ abstract data types are syntactic sugar for C style abstract data types. In fact, the very first version of C++ was a computer program whose input was C++ code and whose output was C code. Then you compile that. If you're coding in C++, what are the advantages of using structs versus classes? Only your style. Structs and classes are very, 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 very similar in C++. So now let's take this example and add in the this pointer. So you've got S1, which is here, and S1's heap stuff. Then you've got S2, which is here, and there's its heap allocated variable. When we call the equal sign, remember this is a function. It's a function with an input. The input RHS is a second name for a variable that already exists. It's a second name for S1 in my example. We already learned about what references are. So this is me taking the rules that we already know about references and applying it to a much more complicated situation. The rules haven't changed. The situation is more complicated, though. We also know about, we also learned about this in the past. The rules for this have not changed, but again, it's a more complicated situation. So this is a pointer to S2. See my color coding? The colors will say it better than my English. Focus on the blue and green. Focus on the blue and green. This is like a fancy pointery name for S2. RHS is a fancy reference name for S1. You got to get that in your head to write a assignment operator correctly. Once you get that in your head, that, that's the hardest part about getting an assignment operator correct. So the input RHS is the right-hand side? The input is always the right-hand side. The input to the assignment operator is always the right-hand side. So um, you could think of this as S2 dot operator equal S1. Same thing. In fact, that will compile and run and do get the right answer. All right, are your brains exhausted from this? Haha. <laughs> All right, we have a bug, as if it couldn't get any worse. Can anybody, I'll give you 60 seconds to think deep thoughts about this program. <coughs> I'll give you more than 60 seconds. This is hard enough to warrant a picture.
All right, let's take a look. We're going to use pictures to answer the question. Here's my main function, and this is the line of code that we're concerned with. So we know that the left-hand side is like that, right? And we know that the right-hand side OK, so they're the same. Got that. Now let's, let's look at our source code. The equal sign, the first thing, oh, well first, does the equal sign do magic provided by the compiler? No, it does exactly what we told it to do in the source code for the overloaded assignment operator. No magic, only source code that we programmed. So we're reading our own source code, and the first thing we do is call delete. So the computer obediently deletes the array. It's gone. Oh, wait a second. The S just deleted its own array. So now when we try to copy from something that got deleted, the result is undefined. So we just hosed ourselves. Can I answer any questions about the problem? Why is the destructor called? Uh, I think, so delete appears in two different places. One place is in the destructor, like you remembered. A second place is at the beginning of the assignment operator. Why? Because the assignment operator has to get rid of the old array and make a new array that's a different size. That's why. Yeah, th thank you for asking. That, that's a very tricky distinction to, to remember. So um, what should we do if you try to assign something to itself? Nothing. Nothing. OK, there you go. <laughs> Just don't do anything. Uh, this is another example of nice coding style. Do you know what the word deeply nested means? Has anybody seen like for, if, if, while, for, if, and it's just it's like, oh my gosh, it's like so indented, and then it goes off the screen. <laughs> I'm like, wait, no, 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 I'll just get another computer, and then I'll make it wider. <laughs> Good style says, avoid deeply nested code. Here is a trick for deeply nested code. I could have said, I could have done that, right? Or I could invert the logic and make my code more readable. So this is a subtle point here, uh, but this is how programmers prefer to read. Avoid deeply nested code. So we have learned something called the big three. Um, if you have any dynamically allocated storage, in other words, if, if your class calls new, then you probably need a destructor, a copy constructor, and an overloaded assignment operator. If you find yourself writing one of those, you, it's almost 100% that you need all three. So uh, here's how to remember the big three. A lot of people, like the first thing that comes to mind is, well, I'm calling new. I got to call delete somewhere. Where do I do that? Oh, yeah, I do that in the destructor. And then do, 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 and you get the destructor right. Here's where like your memory needs to like kick in and say, all right, you just wrote a destructor. You probably need the big three. The destructor, the overloaded assignment operator, and the copy constructor. So you only need the big three when you're using new. That's the only time when you need You only need the big three. Though, let me just rephrase. I don't like to use the word always and only, because sometimes I get it wrong. Use the big three if you're allocating memory in your class. If you're calling new in your class, use the big three. 
Why? Because of those memory diagrams we saw earlier in lecture where we had those, uh, the little devil guy with the pointer that went to nowhere. What are some cases that um, you need one of them but not all of them? Where are some places where you need one of them but not all of them? Let's talk after class. All right. If you can do this, you understand almost everything we've learned in EECS 280 up until today. Almost everything. Let's do it together. Let's do this example together. So I'm going to use some colors. We'll start off with black ink. I'll do the first line of code where we get an unordered set that has uh, else size capacity, and it points to an array on the heap with uh, size 1. Oops. We start off with size 0 and capacity 1. Then we call insert. Indeed, it is big enough. And so we can do an insert. Sound good? So now I'll do, uh, I'll do this. I keep using the word this. I will execute this third line of code. Uh, that one was S1. S2 is here. Again, we get else size capacity 
Um, and we get an array on the heap. Else points to that array on the heap. Size is 0. Capacity is 3. Have I gotten the right answer so far? Then let's have some fun with this line of code. You might need to read back at the, look back at the source code for the overloaded assignment operator because no magic happens here. Only the source code that you wrote execute, executes. So that's the first trick here is you've got to recognize that my source code executes here. Let's go look at it. Um, what's the first thing that the overloaded assignment operator does? It gets rid of, uh, is it the array from the left-hand side or the right-hand side? Left-hand left side. So here, left-hand side is S2. So this is gone. And I'm going to pop that. I'm going to erase it from my diagram for simplicity. Then uh, do I make a new array? Sure do. What size should it be? Same size as, the, as S1 size one, and then I'll make sure that else points at my new array, and then I'll make sure size and capacity are exactly the same as S1, and then I will copy the contents of S1 to S2. So I walked you through this in English. The code is doing what I described in English while I was drawing. I'm going to catch you after class because I want to make sure we have enough time to finish. We've got a lot of code to run still on this one line. So now we'll use purple and we'll do insert. Uh oh, can we insert when the size, two, can we make an array of size one bigger? No, but we did have that member function called grow. If you can't make an array bigger, what can you do? You can make a second array that's bigger than the first one. So let's double down. We'll make a new array. I need a, uh-oh. There we go. Don't you hate it when you lose your stack? All right, we get a new array on the heap that's bigger than the old array. Then we copy the contents from the old array. Then we point at the new array, and then we delete the old array. Remember, we had like a local variable to keep track of all that stuff. So I'm, this is sort of intuitively what the grow function is doing. Then we can do an insert 43, and then our size and capacity get bigger. OK, are we done? No. Now we have to do the last line of code right here. Does it look like a function runs on this line of code? No. Does a function run on this line of code? Yes. How many functions run on this line of code? Two. So we destroy S1 and S2. Let's do S1 first. So S1, the destructor runs, which calls delete. Then S2's destructor runs which calls delete, then we can pop these off the stack. And it's all gone. And we are also on time. So I'll see you guys on uh, Wednesday. Hi. Hi. So suppose you have a class that can